So, so let me talk about uh, what's going to happen tonight. Uh, this is the result of, of, of several years of, of talking with other citizens, with students, colleagues uh, around the world about why are things so messed up? And, and you know, the, the, the papers don't make one happy in the morning uh, these days, but they haven't really for several years. Uh, things might have taken a more negative turn of late for some of us, but, but, but the papers hadn't been making me happy for some years. And it occurred to me that there are so many issues and there's so few of us to do all of that work that, you know, do I pick the environment as my number one issue? Do I pick political reform as my number one issue? Do I pick fixing the economy somehow as my number one issue and dedicate fully to one of those? Or, when the light bulb went off, it occurred to me that we're probably not going to fix the economy without fixing the political system as well. And we're probably not going to fix the environment without fixing the economy, because it's chewing up the environment. So, so when that light bulb went off, it sort of changed my life. And I began thinking about who's out there. And it turns out that there aren't that many of us in here. There are a few colleagues. Uh, Alan Boring and Derek Grun, who's Derek, where are you? Because you're going to signal me when I'm over time. Um, who, who understand this, but, but we found that all over the world there are lots of people thinking in these terms. So what I want to do is bring in this sort of global thinking here and share it with you. And tonight, your challenge, there will be a test, your challenge is to simply Imagine the world without having to feel that the environment and the economy are pitted against each other all the time and that we have terrible choices to make, but jobs are more important uh, than the melting ice in the Arctic in the winter. Because uh, it's, it's winter now and the ice is still melting up there. So, so your challenge is to reframe your own thinking. Try it on. You may decide you don't like the thoughts you're thinking uh, as you listen to these ideas develop, but at least try it. So that's my challenge to you. See how it works for you. And uh, then we will do other exercises that are different each lecture in the series. So before I begin, I, I want to say thanks first to the Alumni Association for their wonderful support and helping to publicize this. Uh, this is not something that I could tweet about uh, in the fashion of our new president-to-be and expect uh, everyone to be buzzing uh, the next morning. So the Alumni Association has been super kind and helpful. But also, uh, the, the people that I uh, work with at the Center for Communication and Civic Engagement, which is the most, really, most enjoyable part of my life here as a teacher and a scholar and a learner because I learn from uh, the people, the faculty, the grad students, the undergraduates who fill this space with interesting projects like the Next System, which was a teach-in that we held uh, in uh, this building in the spring. But I also want to thank the comm department, who is super helpful. How many of you are here because David Domkey recommended it? Wow, see, I, I owe a big, big thanks uh, to David and to the wonderful staff, uh, Gina, Junko, Megan uh, of the comm department. But I also want to thank the students, some of whom are here tonight. Um, Emily's here, Sky is here, Kelsey's here, uh, Chief Hay has the flu, I'm sorry. Yun Kong is, is here, uh, and, and Nate uh, is not here tonight. But these students have all helped develop a campus learning model for these ideas. And we'll share that with you a little bit later on. And the kitchen cabinet at the center is very important to me because it keeps me honest and tracking and tells me if anything makes sense. So I would like to thank these folks. Um, and a huge thanks to Derek, without whom none of this would happen. So thank you, Derek. And finally, thanks to you for being here. So we will talk more about what we can all do together 
uh, if these ideas make some sense. So we live in complex systems. I'm going to talk about four of them tonight and through this series, uh, pulling each one out uh, for different weeks. But it's, it's complicated, but I take my cue from uh, Al, who said, you yeah, don't overcomplicate, it's complicated enough. So, so my goal is to try and make it as simple to understand these four interacting systems as possible. And here's a beginning point. Imagine what it would be like if this was the way those systems were nested. Right? Imagine that. So, so that, that society was conscious of living in a finite environment on a planet that's uh, not able to support all of us already. And that society actually controlled government enough so that what government did reflected that environmental context and that all of those things were trying to design an economy that worked for the people and for the planet. Imagine that. I'm going to help you imagine it in a different way in a minute. But instead, I, I sort of sense it's more like this. The economy is the biggest thing going, right? It's the God term. It's, it's everything. We're kind of afraid of it, in a way. Um, and, and then government is sort of serving the economy, but not altogether serving society, because the economy is more important than society, you might wonder. And then, of course, the environment is being kind of chewed up by all of these spheres. So this is kind of my ideal way of feeling and imagining uh, the world we live in, and this is more how I think uh, it is most days. So let's look at how those four systems interact uh, to help you follow the discussion. I've kind of color-coded the pieces that are interacting. And this is, as I said, keep it simple. So I could talk about a lot more pieces, but that would be too complicated. So I'm going to just give you some ideas. So let's start with the economy. That seems to be where every conversation uh, starts, and many of them stop. And if you think about the economy, the current era, we've, we, we, next week is all about capitalism and how to make it better. But for now, I'm going to use this term neoliberal, which means sort of the preference for privatizing things. So our Secretary of Education-to-be has an ideological preference to get rid of public schools and to privatize education, and she actually owns investments in private charter school companies, so we don't know if that's a conflict of interest, because apparently those don't apply in this case. But, but, but the idea is that private trumps, if you'll pardon the pun, <laughs> publicness, and has for some time. And in, in the late 90s and into the 2000s, we've developed a kind of casino capitalism where a lot of the growth in the economy has been paper growth not growth that produces jobs, good jobs, produces education uh, without people having to pay so much for it. Uh, you can imagine different kinds of investments producing different kinds of social rewards other than wealth for a few. So around this, and, and th this is kind of where society kicks in and interacts with the economy, we have consumerism. We live in our consumer bubbles. I am a professional shopper, as my family who's here will uh, tell you. Uh, so, so consumerism is an important piece of the economy for those of us who are fortunate enough to be consumers. But in many ways, much of the growth of our economy over the last couple of decades has been driven by debt. Public debt, but interestingly enough, private debt is bigger. I'm going to get to that in a minute. So, so we, are, we, we are growing basically because we are in debt, deeply in debt. The other thing that's been growing is inequality. So there are a lot of ways to engineer an economy so that more people benefit or not. And this economy, it's not accidental that a lot of the growth that it has enjoyed has gone upward. So inequality has grown, which is a social phenomenon. It's, not, it's a social phenomenon in the sense that it makes people feel bad when they're on the bottom and they see people on the top. 
And it also creates political differences that aren't good for democracy. And then another social feature is the replacement of good jobs with uh, technology. I'm going to talk about that in a minute too. But outside of this strange economic engine that interacts with society in these ways, we are also looking at phenomenal rates of resource depletion and waste. And we've created a, an increasingly toxic environment, uh, which is more toxic for some people on the planet and some people in this country uh, than for others. And all of this is brought to us by the complete conviction that most people have that we have to keep growing. We have to keep growing. Now, it doesn't matter whether you read Paul Krugman, he'll tell you we have to keep growing. He's got a little different way of producing growth. Or if you listen to the Goldman Sachs team that Donald Trump is going to bring in to engineer growth. Um, but growth is the bipartisan, kind of the, the bipartisan meeting point in Washington these days. And, and it's a big problem for reasons that I'm going to share with you in a minute. But the short story here is that growth produces all of these crises. It's chewing up resources, producing more waste than we can process on the planet, creating energy crises. There's an irony of growth. Gasoline is cheap right now. I filled my car at half the price that I was filling it before the financial crisis. But if we start growing, Oil is going to become more expensive, which will slow down the growth. So that's the dilemma that we're in. And then there's the debt crisis that I'm going to talk a little bit more about because it's really huge, as both Bernie and the Donald would say, huge. Probably the only thing they have in common. Um, so we have these rising costs of growth. It costs more and more to grow all the time. And that slows growth down. So we have gotten into this dilemma where we really can't grow. And next lecture, I'll talk about why that is. But the short story is this period of amazing growth from 1950 to roughly 2000 is unprecedented before in, in history. And I am going to argue with you, it won't happen again no matter how much debt we generate to try to grow. So that's kind of a picture of where we are. And there are all these people who are pointing out uh, what's happening. But there are those who are benefiting too much in the moment from what is happening to pay attention. So here's one of my favorite quotes uh, from an economist, actually one of the few economists that I will be quoting at much length in these lectures. Uh, Kenneth Boulding, who was, turns out, uh, John Kennedy's environmental advisor. And this was his operating uh, guide. So from time to time, you've already gotten an email, I hope, about readings you can do if you want to read more about this kind of thinking. Uh, here's another book that isn't on that reading list, but it's available uh, easily enough, called Enough. So here we are uh, with the new president pledging 4%, which if it happens, if this happens, there will be a tremendous boom in the stock market. That 4% will go upward. And I doubt very much if much of any of it will distribute outward. And so the question of even if this is possible at the price of leveraged debt, who's going to benefit from it? So here's, here's the debt picture in a, in a nutshell. This is the GDP last year. Um, this is personal loan. By the way, uh, student loans have recently passed credit card debt. Uh, and I experience that every day on the job here because my students are leaving here with 30,000 or so on average in debt, uh, which is not a great way to start your, your life. Um, the corporate debt is even bigger. So we've got a big corporate debt problem. Uh, and as we discovered, uh, what happens when corporate debt becomes that disproportionate, we end up with too big to fail and bailouts. 
So look for those in the future. And then the public debt that everybody is so worried about is actually uh, relatively small. So here's, here's the, this was uh, an earlier set of figures. This is now a little over 60. So the accumulation of public and private debt is over 60 uh, trillion. And the uh, GDP is approaching about 20. So one of the things I'm going to be talking to you about is why are we so obsessed with GDP? Why? What does it measure? What is it doing? Uh, but it's what people use to see if the economy is going well. So, so the interesting uh, thing about this strange notion of the growth of private debt supporting everything, because we all know we want government to be frugal and we want to downsize the budget and so on and so forth, is that, that we've translated a, a kind of a strange privatized Keynesian logic into supporting the economy. So that's what's happened is we've shifted from public spending, which was the Keynesian model. You can spend and then the economy grows and then you can grow so big you pay off the debt. The problem with this is that if the economy isn't growing in proportion to the amount of debt that is being used to fuel it, you can't ever pay it off. And so there are likely to be greater periods of instability and, and crashes. So another pledge somehow in this 4% growth spurt that we are promised uh, we will enjoy in the coming years, um, there's going to be, I, I heard uh, Mr. Trump say today, he's going to be the greatest job creator ever, ever. So let's think about what that might mean. Well, he says we're going to pull back these trade agreements, NAFTA and, the, and several others, the TPP and so on. Well, what would that do? So if you look at manufacturing, and these are good jobs, right? These are jobs at carrier air conditioning. These are jobs building Fords in Ohio. Um, well, in the last 15, 16 years, we've lost 5 million of those jobs. And estimates are that this is how many of them were due to trade agreements, and this is how many of them are due to robots. So now, hold that thought, robots. What is the position of Trump and some of his appointees on robots? What do you think? Huge, huge, huge. OK, it turns out while we weren't looking, U.S. Steel is back, but it's not U.S. Steel, the old U.S. Steel of giant factories and giant furnaces. It's little steel mills in California and scattered around the country, um, most of which are being run by robots. Okay? So, so actually, manufacturing isn't doing so badly in the U.S. It's being done by robots, however, which raises the question of should the economy serve the workers and the citizens, or should it serve the investors who own the plants? So here's what Trump says about technology. This was to Silicon Valley executives in a December meeting. We want you to keep going with this incredible innovation. Anything we do do to help this go along, we're going to be there for you. So he wants more of this, and Silicon Valley is is, is launching driverless vehicles. One of the biggest occupations in the country is driving. Taxi cabs, Uber is investing in driverless cabs. Trucks, buses, all of that stuff is going to be automated. So, so we want you to do more of that, and where do the jobs come from if we do more of that? Here's the one that I think is really telling, Andrew Puzder, who's going to be our labor secretary said this about robots. Always polite, they always upsell. He's a fast food CEO. They never take a vacation. They never show up late. There's never a slip and fall or an age, sex, or race discrimination case. They're the perfect workers. So we are looking at, and don't blink, we are looking at an economy without workers. Ha. Huh. I find this dizzying. I don't know what to make of it. Well, I do, but I, 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 for some time, I thought, 
it, this is crazy. This is almost an insane set of system dysfunctions. So instead of getting dizzy when you pick up the paper in the morning, try this lecture series feature. Okay? <laughs> instead of having this reaction, okay, d don't, don't think that. And, and please don't say it. Okay? Let's think about WTD, what to do. Okay? So today, the what to do is we're just going to connect the dots. Okay, we're going to have some more activities that we can all think about doing together in future lectures, look at examples of people who are doing really amazing things uh, in the public space that we occupy. So we're going to talk about the economy next week, political solutions, and real world projects. So all of those are coming attractions today. Sit back and relax and connect the dots. So here's the the what to do's in the future. New economic ideas coming next lecture. Strategies for political change. Some of you might be interested in thinking about those. And then how can we communicate differently about the environment and the economy so that we think about them both together and always together? And then what are people doing here in Seattle, in King County, and around the world to actually realize these kinds of ideas? Okay, so here's another what to do. Allow yourself to go back to this idea and try and imagine this world. Try and imagine you and the seven billion people on the planet, your neighbors, Seattle, the United States, in this world, not this one. So think about how would it be and how do I imagine all of these systems being nested like this? And imagine an economy that wasn't trying to create more robots instead of workers, but an economy that was trying to serve the needs of society, including giving people decent jobs. And finally, imagine what the government would look like if this were to happen. So just allow yourself a Zen moment, close your eyes and imagine that, wow, the environment is really the big thing, not the economy, the environment is the big thing. And society is aware of that and society controls government to protect it so we can have future generations and the economy is going to serve all of these. So let's, let's, let's go in, let's, let's dive into this. And, and the, it seems to me the easiest place to sort of think about how complex systems interact, in this case, the um, economy and society is with us as consumers, okay? As I said, I'm a professional shopper, so ask me anything about consumerism and I'm happy to share. In fact, I think a post-retirement job might be to become a shopping assistant for, for rich people so I don't have to buy all this stuff. Um, so shopping is kind of insane if you, if you step back and look at, at the abundance, the overabundance of stuff that we don't really need, uh, at least in that many varieties. Um, this really exists. I don't know. I d wouldn't feel totally comfortable in that vacation setting, but some people do, obviously. And here's one where a luxury cruise ship, they are now building the luxury cruise ships with a super luxury deck so that the super rich people who want to own yachts but don't quite have one yet don't have to mix with all of these wealthy people uh, <laughs> down below. Okay? And it, they're, they're actually making money. Um, so, so what is consumerism? Well, I, I would invite you to think of it like this. It is the most widely shared set of practices and values we have on Earth. The most widely shared. Wow. It's what brings us together. A lot of things divide us, but we all, most of us, like to shop. We can't all afford the same things, but we all, most of us, like to shop. So, and, and because this is so basic, so fundamental to who we are, 
it, it, it kind of shapes to some degree, to some degree, you know, the, the poor kid who wants mom to buy the $200 pair of sneaks, you know, I mean, it's, it's important, it's emotional, it's, it's critical. So who we are and what we want to be, and of course we all want to be cool, and consumer brands promise that. There we go. That's cool. And that's what I see in all my classes. I've watched the transformation in these classrooms from a motley assortment of PCs to cool glowing apples in the dark. So, but there's this dark side, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, which is that it also produces stress. I got to pay the bills. I got to pay off my credit card. I have to work more to be able to take that luxury cruise vacation or buy that cool computer. And, and consumerism is pushing stuff at us, pushing stuff at us, producing all kinds of disorders and depression, which I'll talk about again in, in a second. And at the global level, so that's kind of domestic chaos. But at the global level, you know, the, the, the have-nots who don't have a consumer option are producing the commodities, all the raw stuff that goes into the consumer products. And it's become a kind of a neo-colonialism. I mean, the global order simply forces these countries to do that so we and many people in the north uh, can enjoy or be depressed about this consumer lifestyle. And in the bargain, we are eating up more stuff than the planet can provide and we're producing more toxic waste than the planet can process. All right? Wow. Every time I think about these things, I go, how did this happen? How is it possible that these systems produce these undesirable outcomes? I will answer that question later on. But we are the best. We are the best consumers in the world. 5% um, we are, 5%. And look at, what we, look at the paper. I, I don't even use paper anymore, but apparently a lot of people do. And look at the oil, the gas, the solid waste. You know, all that throwaway stuff produces a waste problem that somebody has to process. So if we all lived in India, not that that's an attractive option for many of us, but, but the planet would be okay, right? If, if every country had the footprint of India, the planet would be fine today. France is kind of, well, it's, it's, they're living at a, a scale of two and a half planets. We'd need two and a half planets to, to be French. We actually need four planets to be us. And if we were trying to air condition the desert, we, we would need five planets. And so right now, collectively, this adds up to a planet and a half, more or less. Uh, and pretty soon, it'll be two planets. And these are some of the sources that these come from. The, the Global Footprint Network is uh, trying to estimate these kinds of consumption and planetary uh, use measures. So, so this, is, this is actually a reality TV show from New Zealand that is an invite. Can you believe New Zealand has an environmental reality TV show? And they go in, they go in like the police, and they start hauling all the bad stuff out and putting it on the front lawn. And then they ask people how they feel about having all this crap in their house. And the people feel really bad, and they promise to do better. And, but, and this is just the stuff produced by oil. So, so, so if you think about the transition to clean energy, you have to think about what happens to all this stuff. Because this stuff will only go away if we really think differently about the consumer society and the consumer uh, acquisition uh, tendencies that many of us have. So what keeps it going at the individual level? I'm going to talk about what keeps it going at other levels. But at the individual level, OK, I, I walk in. This is a Patagonia ad, by the way. So think about what that means. 
but, but I see that, I, I, I have to have it, I like that parka. I, I now convinced that I need it, even though, as uh, my family would say, I probably have three parkas in the closet. They're all just fine and actually stylish enough. And, and then I get it. And then I use it, and then I kind of forget about it, and, uh, and then I see the next new thing. And Patagonia is interesting for several reasons. One, it's a privately held company, so they can tell you not to buy too much stuff. They can also tell you if you buy our stuff, it's going to cost you twice as much as it's going to cost you somewhere else. But that's okay because you really only need one parka, don't you? So shop Patagonia, pay more, but buy less. And Patagonia has actually made a very successful business. Now, I'm not sure Patagonia could sustain this strange business model of anti-consumerism light uh, if, in fact, they were a publicly held company, which is why they have resisted going public, because they think consumerism is a problem. And here's Ed Norton from Fight Club. Um, all my students have seen Fight Club. Anybody here seen Fight Club? OK, all right, good, good. So in, in an undergraduate class, all the hands go up. Um, but when, when Ed Norton realizes, uh, thanks to Brad Pitt, that he's got a consumption problem, he goes, oh god, we're buying things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. No, that's not original to Fight Club. Actually, I think that's original to Will Rogers. Um, but they put it in Fight Club. So there's two questions that I want to raise with you about consumerism here at this point. One is a moral question, is who should be left out? Because the way it works is everybody can't be consumers. Some of them have to produce the stuff that goes into the products that are consumed by others. And some people can only afford not so nice stuff, not so stylish, not so nutritious stuff. So there's a moral question that we don't notice very much when we consume because we are encouraged by the propaganda environment that we are Im immersed in, marinated, from as soon as a child can watch TV, the child is marinated in ads and consumption and buy things. So, so so, so what happens to the moral question, it's not in that environment. Consuming is good. You deserve a break today, all of you. Okay, so all of you go out and get something nice, because you look like you could use it, <laughs> really. And, and one of the reasons why that moral question doesn't get asked by more individuals who are happily out there shopping until they drop, is that, and th this comes from Tim Jackson, and, and I put that book on the reading list, which I invite you to enjoy some of the supplemental readings. But, but the idea is, what does consumerism do for human character development? We, we, have, we, we have a human nature debate. Are people nasty? Are people altruistic? Are people loving? Are they kind? Are they greedy and selfish? Well, if we can imagine people in those ways, that means we are capable of being all of those things. So what if the culture in which we live pushes some aspects of our possible nature and suppresses others? So if the dominant environment in which we live culturally is consumerism, what's it about? See that thing, buy that thing, forget that thing, see that thing. Well, OK, it's a focus on ourselves, which sometimes converge on the narcissistic. And it's a focus on novelty, the next new thing, the upgrade, the bigger screen, the newer model. Trade in your perfectly good iPhone 6 and get iPhone 7 for free. How can you turn that down? It's hard. It's hard. So, so in, this, in this quadrant, what we've got is this piece of human nature being overdeveloped. So our characters often 
spend more time living in this part of our human potential than in the part that would have us focus on other people and their needs or on the past and the future. We live in the now. Now some of us, of course, belong to subcultures in society that focus entirely here or entirely here or more there than here. But most people, I think, live in this diminished quadrant of our human potential. I would like to see us do the 360 and develop all of those aspects of our character. But we can't do it given this economy. So my question for you, and, and as I said, this is a new sport coat, by the way. As I said, <laughs> as I said, I, I understand it because I see it, and I see it in my students. I invite them to take a little test. But first I show them this, and then I invite them to take a little test. Then I'll invite you as well. So here's what it means to be branded, okay? So we start with buying things, which requires us to work, right? And kind of the more we work, the more stuff we can buy, so that's good. On the other hand, the more we work, and the more debt we incur if we can't work enough to buy all the stuff we want, we end up getting stressed. Marketing surveys have told us in the last few years that stress in the US population is off the charts. When, when people are asked, you know, what do you do? What's your life look like? What's your daily home routine look like? And what do you value? People say, well, I, I like to go shopping, and, I, uh, and, and I, my job isn't so much fun, but it pays for my shopping and my vacations and the nice house and the car and all of those things. But oh my God, am I stressed. And so is so, my husband, and so, so are my kids for some reason. So, so you've got this stress problem, which is alleviated, and the advertisers help us alleviate this stress problem by buying something you'll feel better. And it's, it's true, isn't it? I mean, if we go out and we buy something, and in that moment, I mean, it, we might forget that thing, but in the moment of bagging that thing, it's kind of satisfying. It's recreational. And so we are in this cycle, but we are in this cycle in a way that reinforces emotional relations to things and our sense of who we are and who other people are is often through things. If you look at the ads, the ads show us how to be with other people in product environments. And outside of that is politics, which nobody likes, so it's better to go shopping because politics is depressing. Government is even worse. It's the source of all problems. I'm trying my best to volunteer because that makes me feel good and, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, important to do something besides shop. And then there's the future of the world which is hopeless. So, so, so this kind of emotional locked in to this quarter of our human potential is creating a society in which we live emotionally through stuff and vacations and ski trips and con you know all the and it's all fun it's absolutely fun so meanwhile here's the stampede on black friday at urban outfitters and and here's the maldives cabinet meeting in scuba gear uh, because they're trying to get the attention of these people and i'm not sure that they're succeeding very well <laughs> So here's another WTD. Here's a book that's quite good, I think, uh, Beyond Consumer Capitalism, that talks about the system and then how you could imagine a different economy that would be more relaxed. It would involve places for more people. It would involve valuing other things in our lives. But I invite my students, and now I invite you, to, to do these little exercises. Pay, pay attention to what you consume and how you consume it and, and how important it is. And, and look at the, the public spaces. There are very few unbranded spaces. I mean, the, even this space is branded, uh, but, but it's branded with a good thing. Uh, <laughs> 
and how are you branded? I mean, it, it turns out that I, I, I caught the, the brand virus with Apple, and then I started noticing how invasive Apple was becoming, and I realized, oh my God, it's like a bad relationship breakup. And, and now I, I'm, I, I'm having an Apple life, but I'm not as happy in my Apple life as I was at the beginning when I was emotionally branded by it all. So, so here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. How long can you go without buying things beyond necessity? So every spring I teach a class that's about this size, and I offer that challenge and ask the students, and, and please email me, and if you choose to take this challenge, it's hard, I'm not, in, in, it's, don't take this lightly. But if you choose to take this challenge, think about how long you can go, and yeah, yeah your, your double skinny latte, that, that's okay. You can, you can still do that. <laughs> that's fine. But that new piece of tech gear or that new parka or those new shoes, see how long you can go without getting them. And, and last spring, you know, I said, let me know, let me know. And, and at the end of a week, I got an email from a student who said, oh my God, that was hard. I can't believe how difficult that was. I have never done anything that difficult. She said, but I made it, I made it a week. And she was the one, one student made it a week. One. And, and I talked to her and we sort of did a little therapy and <laughs> assured her it was going to be okay and that she could go back to shopping anytime. Um, so, so let's look at, since consumerism is kind of the thread of society, let's look at society now as, as it's affected by these other systems. So unfortunately, some of the picture of, of American society isn't very pretty. We lead the world in these and other things, and those things are disproportionately uh, burdens uh, in the black community, Hispanics, Native peoples, right? So, so that's the society that all of this is producing. So how did that happen? How do we end up with this society? We have income inequality that ranks with these countries. I'll show you where we are in just a second. And consumerism both unites and divides us. I mean, we're, everybody is kind of trying to be a consumer, although some people can't afford it. But we are in special, how, how many levels are there in your airline mileage club? And how bad do you feel if you know the elites are going on and then this senators are going on and then the super people are going on and then there you are, you know, the last one on. It, I, I, feel, I feel bad, I don't know about you, but it, 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 hurt, it hurts me. And then, you know, we're divided in, in political terms. We're divided by race, gender, class in, in ways that we should also reflect a little bit on during this time uh, we have together. And, and environmental politics have become a low priority for reasons I'm going to talk about in just a minute, uh, trumped by growth, disinformation, and, and the politicization of science. I used to think science was a very cool way to know things and challenge that knowledge and update and improve it. But it turns out it's just another way of knowing. And it's a harder way of knowing, so why, why, why do science? A lot of people have direct knowledge received from other sources. <laughs> True. I, I, and in fact, I feel like an embattled minority being, being a scientist. So, so how is all this going mental health wise? Well, the company that the U.S. is keeping um, is, is this company. Okay? Countries we think of as not so advanced. Uh, inequality. Look at the countries that are above uh, the U.S. and around the U.S. and Israel is only in this group because of the Palestinians, right? So, so Israel would be, if, if, if the Palestinians weren't in the Israeli equation, they'd be down here. And then we go, and then, uh, okay, then finally we, we get to these countries. And, and these are really big differences. And what does it mean to have that much inequality? It means that you have lower life expectancy, 
you do less well in math because you can't afford schools for poor people. Infant mortality, homicides, all of these things that we spend so much time debating and trying to solve and make policies to prevent. We could improve all of these things with no political squabbles, policy battles, by simply reducing our level of inequalities so we become more like these countries who are doing better on all these measures, not because they have necessarily struggled with policies for all of them, it's just because they have figured out how to make less inequality. And child poverty. Romania. We are competing with Romania these days. Okay, government. I, I'm running over. Are we are you are you nodding off? Do you do you have a do you have a game? Um, I I probably would be less entertaining if this was a forced march. So <laughs> So, so I, I, I'm going to try and move more quickly at this point, but, but let's think about now government. This is a special topic that we'll get a whole lecture. The third lecture is all about this. So it's just a quick taste today. So I'm calling uh, what we have dino, democracy in name only. Okay? Share it with your friends on Facebook. Uh, so we have legalized corruption that I'm going to walk us all through so you know what that means rather than me just saying and you, you go, oh yeah, that's it, or are you kidding? Um, we have systematic voting rights violations which would have rendered this last election not even close. Not even close. And we have policy choices that are constricted by the U.S. having been a leader but now a member in the global uh, economy of nations. That limits what we can do uh, at, at the risk of pulling ourselves out of this global economy and suffering a really big disruption. Now it could be that that disruption would be worth it and on the other side of it we would be looking at a very different kind of economy and society, but the, the costs of pulling out, as I think Donald Trump is going to show us actually, are going to be severe. And then we have political parties that operate rather like business cartels, trying to dominate the voter market. And of course, we have this kind of archaic electoral college system, which means that uh, unlike almost every other democracy, it's very prohibitive for new parties to form or to be effective. In fact, what new parties tend to do is become spoilers, as happened in this last election. So here's another WTD, what to do, exercise. And, and this is one that's very personal and close to me because I, I teach about democracy to, to lecture classes. And I notice that when I'm getting passionate about democracy, students are writing it down as fast as they can and then see if they could pass the test. And I say, wait a minute, everybody put down your, your writing utensils and let's think about democracy. And what I have discovered more and more over the 42 years that I've been doing this is students today have a very dim sense of what it even means. And I'm going to show you something even scarier than dim. Dim is scary, but there's scarier territory beyond dim. Okay, what does it mean? How is it taught in school? Not effectively, because it's politicized. So it's, it's something you have to be careful about. So, so allow yourself, since we have the freedom to do this, what would a better functioning democracy and government look like? You know, I, I think each of you should engage with this lecture series to address these kinds of questions. I can't answer these questions for you. I, I have my own answers, but each of you should think about, is this as good as it gets, or can it be improved, for whom, in what ways? So think about those questions. Here's an interesting book. Uh, called post-democracy, which is where I got the idea of democracy in name only. He calls it post-democracy, I call it dino. But uh, the same idea. The political parties have been hollowed out. They are basically clients of various business sectors. 
So, and, and Americans see this. This is not just some liberal professor making a pronouncement about this. This is a perceived level, uh, per percentage of the public who thinks the US government is corrupt. And, and that's three quarters of us. So three quarters of Americans think this is a corrupt government. And where do we fit in the world of nations? Here we are. So what's, what publics think of their governments as more corrupt than ours? Mauritius, Cyprus, Taiwan, Poland, that's it. So here's, here's the thing I said, you know, beyond students having a dim sense of democracy, there's actually something even worse, and I don't mean to depress you, um, but coming soon. The question is, how essential is it to live in a country that's governed democratically? And this is by age groups. So those who were born in the 30s, that last great generation, really digs democracy. Okay, a lot. Super important to them. But every cohort born after that, and in the US even worse, look at that, the millennials. How, is it essential to live in a democracy? 30%. What's with that? And here's something that I see in my classes and I want very much to create experiential learning about democracy for our students to go out in the world and come back with a sense of what it might be for them. But if you think about this, can you imagine that 25%, this was 2011, 25% of 16 to 24 year olds in the US thought that democracy is a very bad system. Think about why that might be. What if you were born and then when you began paying attention to politics, all you saw was negative stuff? And, and government dysfunction, and name calling, and fighting, and, and inability to make basic decisions about pretty much everything. You might conclude, wow, if that's what democracy is, give me something else. What is an interesting question, but it could be that they have learned about democracy from watching ours and don't really have the capacity to distinguish between our dysfunctional government and democracy in general. So help me think about ways we can help our students experience democracy differently. That to me is a huge challenge as a teacher. So uh, here's a formula for minority party rule. Um, Trump won Wisconsin by 22,000 votes. 300,000 citizens uh, in Wisconsin uh, didn't have the proper ID to vote. And those were Republican laws. So if you're a minority party and you're not so popular, how can you win? Well, you cheat. Um, or or you, you, you deny 300,000 people the vote to prevent the three citizens who voted twice from doing that. So if you think about gerrymandering, uh, the, 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 the Republicans have gained seats in two ways. One is all those Rust Belt states that were figured so big in Trump's victory. A lot of the younger population has moved out of them to the Sun Belt, where there are no unions, where there are jobs of some sort, Arizona, the whole southern tier of the US. And so there are some natural population shifts, but in all of those states where there's populations moving away and populations gain, there are opportunities to rig the voting districts, gerrymandering. And if you think about what happened to Indiana, the Democrats should have, and this is the 2012 House of Representatives election, Indiana should have 20% more Democratic House members. Michigan should have 20% more Democratic House members if the districting were done equitably. Missouri 12%, North Carolina. So you see the battleground states and you see the effects. So, so we would have a democratic Congress if 
districting had been done equitably. And my sense is that the current attorney general to be isn't going to take up too many of these cases. OK, so just a quick one. Why does, why does drawing voting districts matter? Well, we would be Republican forever if only the men in America voted. OK? We would be Democratic forever if only the women in America voted. We would be solidly Democratic forever if only people of color voted. Uh, pretty Republican, uh, and then if only the white men voted. Anybody think about disenfranchising white males? <laughs> just, just an idea. I, I mean, <laughs> okay, so why all this political dysfunction? On lecture three, we're going to go into money and politics. It's an interesting topic, uh, and the U.S. is like no other democracy in the levels it, that it infuses politics. Uh, voter discrimination of the sort I just pointed out, and gerrymandering of the sort that I just pointed out. So, coming attractions. So, what we've got, and this is coming to the end, what we've got is we have somehow allowed or created, depending on how you think about it, a political system that can't deal with problems. Because people are dealing with power and favors, power and favors. That's the political system. That's what it does really well, power and favors. And oops, we forgot about the environment. Oops, we forgot about child poverty in America. Oops, we forgot about inequality. Uh, we, we, we didn't forget about those things, but we have a government that can't uh, address them. So let's look at the environment, which I regard as all of these are worthy problems for your number one problem. Children in poverty certainly qualifies in that. But I think that all of us are going to be at risk if we don't address the environment soon. So look at the environment and how all of these systems run through it. So we know we've got climate change. Those of us who believe in science, I, I say that it's, and actually we're not a really huge, we're not a huge majority. Okay, we're, you might think we, we are, but we're not. And we've generated toxic life support conditions, which are really severe. Ask the folks in Flint, Michigan. Um, and we've got a species extinction going on while we're shopping. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about that because I, I think that's something that hasn't been talked about enough, but it's happening if you believe in science. Again, I'm, all of this is qualified if you believe in science. And the resource extraction, fracking, and the cleanup costs of all of these things are huge drags on the economy. Okay. And the economy has to grow at, at extraordinary and now impossible rates in order to make these kinds of resource extraction operations pay off. Right now, fracking companies are going bust because the price of oil is so low. And so this, this vicious cycle continues. Climate disruptions and pollutions are drag on the government. The government ends up cleaning up this, this kind of a mess. And as I said, poor people and minorities suffer all of this the most. And yet, we seem to be paralyzed by propaganda. I mean, you know, if you think about the power of ideas, I mean, it's, it's easy to dismiss ideas until you think about our political campaign ideas. And how many times have we heard we would love to deal with global warming and deal with carbon emissions and impose some kind of a carbon tax system of the sort that voters in this state voted down while voting overwhelmingly for Hillary Clinton this last time. So, but it would cost us jobs. Well, jobs that are actually being taken by robots, but that's another story. So, so we, we have this kind of a contradiction. 
of, gee, it's too bad about the environment, but we have to give people jobs, which is also really not happening. So we've got a polarization between the economy and the environment that I think is completely, completely a false dichotomy. There is no reason we can't have a totally productive economy and have jobs and have better distribution. All of that is possible, except for a government that is not interested in those outcomes because they don't benefit those who are buying the government. Sorry. But it's going to get better uh, in here. <laughs> it's, it, and, and with any luck, you will become emissaries and help make it better out there. OK, so what do I mean by this? Here's a poll from uh, a year ago. The economy is the top priority for, in this case, Obama and Congress. But I promise you, when this poll is done again and released probably next week, it'll be the same. And where is uh, the environment? It's 47%. And if you break this out by Republicans and Democrats, environment is still rather low on the Democrats' priority list, but it's higher than 47%. And it's not even on the Republicans' list. It's not on their list. So as I said, all of this is producing something extraordinary, something really amazing is happening on the planet today called species extinction. There have been five of them in the past. Most of them are the stuff of disaster movies. Asteroid hits the planet, big dust cloud for two years, everything dies except little rodents and fish. But this one, which is well underway. You, you all heard about the bees are kind of the poster critter for this extinction. But, but there's a lot of other things besides the bees that are disappearing. So we are in the midst of the sixth great extinction in the billions of years this planet has supported life. But this one is caused by us. It's caused by us as consumers, caused by us extracting too many resources, having the wrong kind of an energy system, and so on. So I invite us to try and not be the species that extinguished itself. That's stupid. I mean, <laughs> so this is the first one produced by a species. So what to do? OK, here's, this is it, folks. This is the, 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 this is the end. I mean, just for this lecture. <laughs> and, and then, <laughs> then I'm going to take. Yeah, the, the, the last word, that, that was too depressing. No, no more lectures, we're, we're, we're done. Uh, so, so what to do about this? I mean, I, I ask myself all the time, and I, as you can see, I'm, a fair, I'm pretty cheerful in the face of this for strange reasons. And the, the reason I'm fairly cheerful is because I think we have a choice to be optimistic and realistic, not wide-eyed optimism, but, but we have a choice to be optimistic because the energy you have is important. It, it, it affects how other people feel, how you relate to, to people, and how, how much energy you have to try and solve these problems. So I try, despite the sometimes depressing nature of our work, um, to be optimistic because pessimism is just a downer. And then that makes me want to go shopping. And, and, you know. <laughs> so, 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 so first thing to do, if the news makes you as dizzy as it makes me pretty much every day, put the paper down. I immediately turn to the sports section. That helps a lot. But in the, in the arts and culture section, that helps a lot. But, but don't despair. Right? There are better things to do than despair. So it seems to me that we have all learned, somehow shockingly, that we have a very poor information system in this country. And it didn't just develop. On, on, on later lectures, I'm going to talk about where fake news came from um, and what we can do about it. But ask yourself this. Ask yourself this, what, what, what's the real fake news? 
I actually vote for B. I think B is a more pernicious form of fake news than A. So think about that. And later on I'm going to talk about all the news systems we have from the New York Times to Breitbart to Macedonian fake news websites that are making money from people who are sharing the stories that are being made up uh, around the world. So to continue connecting the dots, what we have done is put together, thanks to Emily, you're here somewhere, yay, Emily, somewhere up there, yay, there you are. Thanks to Emily Tasaka, uh, she has put together a set of readings with annotations and links um, that you have available and we will continue adding to this reading list. Uh, it's, it's available on the Rethinking Prosperity website, so just Google rethinkingprosperity.org and you'll find a lot of useful reading material that is positive. This is all positive readings about what we can do better and different. And feel free to visit our center website, which has a lot of projects, the current Rethinking Prosperity. The idea is we can rethink what it means to prosper. Right? GDP isn't producing prosperity. It's propagandized as producing it, but it's not. So what other ways might we prosper? And think about that. I think there are a lot of ways in which we can prosper. And, and there are lots of countries around the world that are beginning to ask that question. Canada has an interesting new public movement called LEAP. And they are trying to figure out how can Canada prosper within environmental limits with more meaningful democracy that better serves society. And um, I, I'm hoping that we will be having a visitor from the north in April, and I will be inviting you to her lecture, and it's free. Uh, and she's probably better than I am. And Naomi Klein is going to come in um, April, and so we'll be talking a little bit more about that. But, but the idea of what does it mean to prosper and how can we better prosper? And if you think about it, it's the stuff we enjoy doing, spending more time with our friends, our family. Yeah, and, and yet if we're working so hard and having so much stress that even our time with friends and family isn't relaxing and meaningful, that's, you know, that's not prospering. So there are a lot of things, good health, that's prospering. All of these things, leisure, you know, working less hours a week, that's prospering. And, and indeed, we could be doing all of that. All of that is possible. So let's think about what it means to prosper, how we can be more prosperous while growing less of an economy and sharing the proceeds more widely. And if that's socialism, what's in a name? <laughs> what's in a name? Turns out that a, a somewhat more interesting comment on young citizens today is that uh, the, the depressing comment is that 25 percent of them think democracy is a bad form of government. The more interesting, you make of it what you will, fact about young people today is roughly half, and this is where Bernie Sanders drew his support, think they'd rather try socialism than capitalism. And why? Same reason. They've looked at capitalism not produce for the good of society, and they think maybe it's time to try a change. So we're living in that kind of, I'm actually gonna be maybe surprising some of you and help us think about capitalism that would work better. So, so I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna, Naomi Klein is gonna tell you that we've gotta, we've gotta try socialism. I, I'm not gonna do that. I might believe it, but I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> so, and then, uh, so, so think about our, our blog and about this projects on the center that you can uh, enjoy and give me feedback about. So with that, I'm going to say, here's some of the stuff we do. That room upstairs, uh, the Walker Ames room in the spring was full of students and community members 
exploring these topics, and it was amazing. It was amazing. Students came away from that having met people in the real world dealing with these ideas and coming away inspired. That's, to me, uh, the best kind of teaching where I step back and they learn from each other. So with that, I'm going to say that was it for lec lecture one. And we will do some questions in just a minute. Uh, for those of you who have to go, thank you very much. And for those who'd like to stay, please do. Thanks. Um, you've talked about economic growth, and I notice you've not talked about population growth. To the best of my knowledge and science out there, we're well over the carrying capacity of the planet now. Where does that factor in? Well, I mean, there's a couple of answers to that. One is, if every, in India being one of the most populous nations, if all the people on the planet, not that I'm recommending this, lived in, in the footprint of India, we'd still be well within our planetary boundaries. So, but that's not a very attractive option for, for most of us. Um, my feeling is that population control is kind of a non-starter politically. I mean, because if you think about it, the, the populations that are growing are southern populations for interesting reasons having to, to, you know, you know what the story is there. So those populations are growing more rapidly and who's going to tell them not? Who's going to tell them not? And, and should it be those people who make that sacrifice? I, I, I just don't see a political solution. These things I see political solutions for. I, I really see the potential for um, living relatively sustainably and in, in relatively good fashion for especially the lucky of us who live in the North. Okay, so I, th I think that's a real, a real chance. If we can fix our politics, if we can fix our economy once we fix our politics. So, um, I, I'm not going to say it. Well, I will say it. Th th that all those southern people who are populating more rapidly will also be the first to go when the, the, the crises of the environment become more pronounced. So, so there will be a kind of Malthusian moment when I mean, I've, I've heard different estimates, uh, but a couple of billion people may not be with us in 30 years. So, and that's not going to be a political decision, that's going to be the planet. That's just going to be a planetary decision, and there aren't enough care packages to solve that problem. So, who's, can, you, okay, please. I think you have a terrible catch-20, that's not long enough. They, they're trying to okay, record sorry. these back there. Oh, okay. I think you have a terrible catch-22 in trying to teach students to like democracy when you have to have an educated electorate in order to make democracy work. How are you going to get them to like it when it, when it works badly? Uh, that's a problem. And, and, but but I, I do commend all of us to talk about democratic change and democratic reform in more positive terms that appeal to young citizens. And I, I, I'm not arguing on behalf of Bernie Sanders, but he did that. And he did that really on a large scale. Jeremy Corbyn, who's kind of the Bernie Sanders of the UK, did that. And what's interesting is that their own parties, the Labour Party in the UK, the Democratic Party in the US, didn't want them. Right? So they kind of stigmatized those candidates. I mean, the, the, the UK tried to get rid of, of Corbyn. Um, and th the young people he brought in as party members re-elected him. He got the votes 
of less than 10% of the sitting members of the Labour Party in Parliament. And I'm guessing Bernie Sanders uh, would receive an equally cold shoulder in the Democratic Party uh, if, if he were trying to lead it. Because it, it disrupts things. Democracy should be disruptive, you might argue. But some people think that it's sort of cozy in power, power and influence. So, yep, yeah. and then right behind you comes the mic. I think so, Hello. yeah. Relative to your challenge regarding purchasing things, apart from necessities, how do you define necessities? I said uh, the double skinny latte is, is a necessity. Uh, <laughs> Not for me. And, and somewhere around that is a, is a gray, ambiguous zone. Uh, but, but, but people, you sort of know, I, I mean, the, the, the Patagonia ad does talk about how wants and needs become blurred. So there is, I think, a psychological problem in deciding what's a necessity. And, and I, I suffer that, and I think many people do. So I think that's a personal decision. I mean, it, in a way, it, it, it's helpful if you realize that it's something you need to decide. So everybody can decide their own, what do I have to have, right? And, and you know, I think that's a good exercise for everybody who wants to engage with this stuff to, to, to do. I'm going to take that challenge. Good, thanks. You'll tell me how long Till you make Till the end it? of the lecture series. No. Yeah. <laughs> At least. Any, anyone else want to join this brave soul? To the end, I would think that's March 7th. Okay, how, how many people want to take the challenge? Wow. Okay, I'll tell you what. Okay. Do you, do you think I should take this challenge too? <laughs> I'm going to see how long I hold out. Okay, so thank you for, for issuing the challenge. Yes. Uh, so, Yung Kang, can you hang on? The mic is coming. I want to respond to the first question. It is demonstrable, scientifically demonstrable, that population growth rates drop dramatically when women are educated and women are not oppressed. The evidence is in, in society after society, that, that population growth rates actually drop sometimes below replacement rates when women have the ability to make the decisions. I'm sure that's true. So the question is, since we have trouble making positive social policies in our own country, what is the political mechanism that would possibly deliver such educational abundance in places where people don't have running water or sanitation? And I, I'm completely in favor of doing that. I just don't quite imagine how it would work. So can we take a, okay, you have, uh, Mike has the answer. Actually, we could have provided and paid for the tuition of every school child in the world at the schools around the world for what we spent on Iraq. No, that sounds like an interesting proposition that's uh, probably true as well. So, right. We're thinking about. Any other questions? And, yes. So hang on. Just pass it down. Oh, okay. And this is just an observation. When you were showing the circles at the very beginning, mm -hmm. the circle that's the desired situation with the environment on top, and then I think it was society and then government and economy, 
it reminded me of the chief self letter to the white men and to the Indians that's mm -hmm. at the totem pole, where he talks about how the white man doesn't really understand the earth, Mother Earth and the environment and mm -hmm. all of these things. And it seems to me that maybe it, the Native American kind of spirit is sort of along those lines. Yeah, I, I think yeah. That's, a, that's a good observation. Gonna hog the mic, it's just right next to me. Just real quick, like the direction and, and appreciate your time. Just wondered how you think about these topics in, in the context of a global environment. Um, it's all one thing I get to, to, to say, well, let's have more jobs and fewer robots, but if Japan doesn't do that, uh, how many people are gonna, we're willing to pay three times as much for a GM product versus a Toyota? Yeah, I mean, these are, these are all valid questions, but I think they all begin with different understandings, right? I mean, th th these are not super complex ideas. They're just different ideas. So, so if we ever had an election campaign in which these kinds of ideas were being debated, wow. I mean, you know, not only is Donald Trump not going to deliver those factory jobs because his analysis of the problem, which is widely shared, so it's not, I'm, blame, I'm not blaming Donald Trump for a misunderstanding, it's a mass level misunderstanding. So he's playing into that uh, and, and it's just widely believed. But on the other hand, other countries, Germany being an interesting example, are, are even ahead of the US in technological replacement, but Germans have a slightly different governmental value scheme, and they sort of want people to be having lives, right? And, and so, so they've kind of slowed down the replacement of humans by robots to try and figure out what to do. And so in Europe today, and, and, and only in the tiny ways here, we're talking about um, guaranteed minimum incomes. Right? And, and there's plenty of money, back to the point uh, that, that Mike was raising, about the money we spend on misguided adventures could go to things like minimum income. Do we really need new nukes? Uh, or would we like to have everybody who's going to be going through this kind of painful transition to the jobless economy protected from the worst case of being on the street and the minimum income? So, so there are different schemes being talked about, as I said, much more in Europe than we're hearing here. But Europeans are beginning to talk about this and have experimented with way more diverse kinds of uh, work weeks, of social benefits, uh, of housing arrangements, shared housing where you only need one leaf blower instead of everybody on the block. I mean, you know, things like that are, are, are actually being put into practice in places like Denmark. So I, I, I think we could have a different conversation for starters. Yes. Hi, could you just uh, say something about where we find the recommended articles and resources? I haven't received any emails, so. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, I will make sure, so you have been signed up? Right. Yeah. It's in the middle of a letter, so it's in the middle of your letter. Oh. How many people did not get the email saying you can, oh, no. Oh, so will you do two things for me? Um, one, check the spam filter, or the, you know, the, 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 the junk folder, because we are worrying. I can't believe this, but that mail's coming from the comm department might be regarded as spam. I don't. Uh, OK, and it's not there. So Derek, we need to figure out why so many people didn't get that reading list. But, but the answer is, go to rethinkingprosperity.org. And, and it's, I think, still the first post on that blog. So rethinkingprosperity.org. If you like those readings, I can easily provide more. Emily can, uh, is still going to be doing more. So uh, we'll give you as much as you want. Hello. Um, yes. So my question is, could we have a functioning economy uh, or a functioning democracy without a functioning economy? Because uh, um, 
I've always thought that in order for you to have a democracy, you have to have a functioning economic system, correct? What's I your think the, uh, that's why we're talking about all of these things together. So yes. Okay. And so um, I've always thought, uh, I was born and raised in the Middle East. And um, when we talk about the United States, economically it's always been strong, but at the expense, so the democracy that uh, exists in the United States has always um, been possible because of the exploitation of countries um, in Africa, in the Middle East, right? Mm -hmm. So when we talk about fixing the uh, democratic system here, are we talking just about the United States or worldwide? Does that make sense? Well, both. But I think, I hope, it's easier to imagine doing it here. I mean, because we are citizens here. We can join movements here. We can demand change here. And we can talk about what kind of change we think we should have here. It's a little bit trickier in all those ways. What kinds of ideas play better in what cultures, what countries? We may not be well equipped to decide that. Uh, we, in fact, when we think we know the answer, it often ends badly. Witness the mess in the Middle East today based on people who thought they understood what was good for people in Iraq and Afghanistan. Turns out they were wrong. So, so now we've got a cascade of other problems based on wrong thinking about what people in those countries needed. So, so it's very tricky to start issuing solutions to the world. I think it's really, really tricky. I think we should engage in dialogue with people around the world. One of the projects that, that we are developing, Alan Borning and Derek and several others of us in, in the clubhouse at the center is, is this global thought network, which will involve people from other countries, scholars, activists, ordinary citizens to actually address these kinds of issues on the global scale. So if you're interested in joining that project, we've got uh, some places for you. So last question, let's have uh, one final question and then we're out into the rain. Uh, thank you for inviting us all to think about things in a different way. Um, it, uh, it, it seems to me that humans aren't particularly good at um, avoiding long-term problems. Um, it, it also seems that, well, I, and I've read a couple different schools of thought about how change happens. Some people would suggest that it happens through crisis, that a crisis has to emerge in order to mm -hmm. force us. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can think about earthquake safety in Seattle as an example, like an obvious problem we're not doing much about. Right. Uh, and others have suggested that it, in sort of a period of long, slow decline, that maybe we're able to, it sort of opens up the opportunity for experiments, and those experiments then turn into future solutions. What, what's, what's your view on sort of how systemic change happens and what we should expect in that If realm? I had to put my money on what's the scenario now, before we've all started thinking new thoughts and sharing them and figuring out things we can do, it'll be the crisis scenario. And it's not going to be pretty. It, it, it'll, it'll actually affect some of us. I mean, we're, we're sort of the last to be affected by the kind of collapse that could occur but it'll even affect some of us. Um, on the other hand, it seems to me that if, if by the end lecture, we'll be talking about what people are doing in different places, facing different realities, um, to try and build more sustainable communities, better functioning economies, governments that work, and, and all of the above, in appropriate local contexts. And there are many people, and, and I, 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 I will actually share with you a preview. I, I'm not going to pick the scenario that I think ought to happen or will happen. I want to be optimistic, and I see a lot of amazing community projects all over the world. I mean, and, and some of them in, in really unlikely and very dire circumstances. So I have colleagues uh, who are working in uh, Kibera, which is a, 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 a slum outside of Nairobi, 
that has over a million people and you won't find anything on a Google map. If you, if you pull up this community on a Google map, there's nothing there, but a million people live there. And yes, th there are streets, kind of. There's people who are educating children. There are midwives, but it's, it's chaotic. Um, if you saw um, this John, Le or if you read the, 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 the book, The Constant Gardener, the John Le Carre novel, that was set in this scene. Uh, where drug companies are coming in and doing uh, unethical human experiments on drugs that turn out to be killing people in this community. And with very little money, very small NGO, there's like five people, NGO, went in with some smartphones and some programming and made connections, including connections that provided them with police protection because the Nairobi police won't go in there. So there's no, there's no police. But there are gangs that provide police for certain members of the community in certain areas. They help this community map itself. So now the people who live in this million person slum know and update these maps regularly and know where's a school, where's a healthcare facility, where's a midwife, um, where are the toxic, because a lot of the uh, technology that we throw away ends up in these kinds of communities and gets burned and goes into the air and the water supply and kids play and get sick. And so there are toxic sites that are now on the map so parents can keep their kids away from those, those places, and, and it's quite remarkable. So there's, there's a lot of really positive, amazing stuff going on around the world, and it may be, given the scale of the dysfunction, what we should begin thinking about is local solutions. And even if, at the very least, we should be thinking about local solutions, at the very least. And if that's as good as it's gonna get, better than nothing at least it's a start, and from those local solutions, maybe models will appear that will scale, that other people will try. And I see a lot of examples of that. So if, if the, the, the political system at the top isn't open to sweeping change, and we don't feel like having a revolution, because it's time consuming and we, nobody shops during a revolution, and it's just like all kinds of stuff, so, so maybe we all should think about local solutions that have something to offer other people in other places that can be adapted. And then we can think from that what might scale in terms of more systemic change. So with that, I'm gonna say thanks for the great questions, all of you. Thank you.